episode 56. Hello, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Dog Man Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host as we listen to eyewitness encounters involving one of the most terrifying cryptids, Dog Men. Our first guest tonight is Travis Nevels. Travis, welcome to Dog Man Encounters Radio. Thanks so much for coming. Hello, Vic. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. Travis, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm a musician. I was formerly a chef, and uh, my hands kind of got messed up. I've recently had five surgeries from the elbows down from playing the guitar too much in the early 90s. I went into security work for a little while, and I started having hand problems down in Texas and lived around Austin. And I moved up to Arkansas about nine years ago. And uh, that's about it. I hope that gets better soon. Thank you. You're welcome. Please tell us about the Knowers of Sasquatch Journal and Reverb Twang, your YouTube channel. Well, I've had the Reverb Twang YouTube channel for a while, and I have did everything from filming sporting events to nature. And uh, then when we found the tracks and started doing research here, I had too much to really write in a journal, and I, I wanted to share it with with the community because a lot of people keep their Bigfoot journal to themselves and don't let everybody see it and stuff. So I, I really wanted a way to get all this information out there to share with other people. I haven't had a chance to check out that YouTube channel yet, but I fully intend to. Sounds like it's got a lot of good stuff on it from talking to you in that pre-interview. Travis, you had your dogman encounter because you were out investigating Sasquatch activity in your research area. How did you get into researching Sasquatch in the first place? Well, I've always liked to go and look at tracks. and uh, There's a lot of bear and coyotes and all kind of other animals up here, and I've been looking at tracks since I was a kid and going in the woods. And uh, I met a friend of mine through the Internet that made... Indian flutes and stuff, so um, I, I was going to buy a couple of flutes from him. He came to my house on the 4th of July, uh, 2013, and when I was talking to him about a documentary that I was working on on coyotes, uh, he seemed to take an interest in it. So I asked him if he wanted to go walk down this trail and look for some checks, and he said, sure. So uh, we hiked down this trail about 30 minutes, 45 minutes looking at tracks. We've seen bear tracks. We've seen coyote tracks. And then he says, look at this one. And I walk over there and uh, there's a perfect human-looking 16-inch track. It took me five or ten seconds only to rationalize everything in my mind that it could possibly be. And then the first thing I said was, Bigfoot's real? I, I couldn't believe it. We kept looking around. There was a lot of bear tracks and there was a lot of poop around. So it looked like the bears were there before the Bigfoots were there because we found some more on top of the bear tracks that were about, you know, 12 or 13 inches, a couple different sizes. And then we found one big 18-inch track. That's what started it off. You admitted to me that you used to make fun of people who believed in Bigfoot. What do you have to say about that now? Well, I would like to apologize to everyone <laughs> for sure. Uh, yeah, well... I used to watch that Bigfoot shows and stuff, and I would laugh at them whenever a stick would break in the woods and everything. And, you know, now I won't even go in the woods at night. I won't go by myself, and I definitely won't go without a gun. Well, those all sound like good practices to me. Do you have some kind of ultimate goal you're working towards with all this? Well, as far as the research and stuff, I don't have a background in any kind of science. I'm just looking for answers myself, and I, I keep finding more questions. Yeah, it's kind of funny how that works. The more you find out about all of this, the more questions you wind up having. Pretty frustrating. What have you done to increase your knowledge about cryptids in general? Besides the in-the-field research, just reading every possible thing I could. And uh, when I found the Bigfoot tracks, I was like, what other kind of cryptids are out there? Please tell us about all the prints you found over the years. From talking to you, it sounds like you found quite a few of them. Well. The, the first day when we found those tracks on the 4th of July trackway, but then the next day I drew a picture of the tracks that we saw. Since then, 
I went back and got castings of everything that I drew. The main reason I did all that is just to prove to myself that I'm not crazy and to have evidence myself that I can look at that way 20 years down the road. I'm not going to try to lie to myself and tell myself what I saw was bear tracks or something different. From what I understand, unless conditions are just right, it's really hard to get a good cast. That's true. I've probably seen 40 tracks that were uncastable, and it's hard to find a good one in the right conditions, especially here because of the creeks are all rock. Yeah, that's not a good situation for casting. One day while you were looking for Sasquatch prints, you stumbled upon a print that clearly hadn't been made by a Sasquatch. Please tell us about that. Well, I took video of it, and I, I didn't know what it was. I, I knew it wasn't any animal I recognized, and I knew it wasn't a Sasquatch. And it took me probably listening to 30 or 40 of your episodes before I actually went online and looked up Dogman tracks. And when I saw the ones in the snow that was associated with the Dogman, uh, my heart skipped a beat because it looked just like the video I had titled uh, Unknown Track. Yeah, I know the print you're talking about. It's a print that Jody Cook took from what I understand. I'm going to post a picture of it in the YouTube version of this show. Over the years, how many Dogman prints have you seen? Probably about six or seven that I would associate with Dogman. Were those all found in your research area behind your house? Yes, sir. Between you and Jeff, who's the most likely to panic and bolt if you stumble upon a big, creepy Dogman in the field? That's really hard to say. He's a little shaken up more than me, I think but he would probably be able to draw his gun and unload into it quicker if it was coming at us. You know, it's one of those things. You can have this idea in your head of how you would respond if you did run into a dogman while you're out there, but I guess you never would really know unless you were faced with that situation. Moving on, I alluded to that research area behind your home. From what you've said, that seems to be your primary area of focus when it comes to research. Please tell us about that area back there. Well, Rock Creek runs from Logan County on the Arkansas side to LaFord County on the Oklahoma side where Honubby is, the siege at Honubby and all that came through there. So it's uh, like the, our Bigfoot Highway. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they use Rock Creek from, from my research to go back and forth across the valley in uh, Rock Canyon. Is it really hilly territory or fairly flat? What's the layout like back there? Well, there's trails going through the valley and the Rock Creek itself, but whenever you're off the trails, you, you can't get horses or dogs or anywhere in there. It would be impossible to try to capture or kill a Sasquatch in the area. Sounds like it's pretty tangled then from what you're saying. Tell us about the coyotes behind your home you habituated and what was your reason for doing that in the first place? Well, uh, I bought a camera and I love playing with it, you know, and filming different stuff. And uh, I happened to stumble across in 2011 a mother raising five cubs in the field behind my house. So I started going back there morning and evening, twice a day, setting up a camera. And I would just sit back there and do my yoga stretches and a little Tai Chi and stuff and uh, watch the coyotes and film them. And I've got hours of footage. And uh, they got used to seeing me there. You know, the mother was still always had her eyes on me, watching me, but they didn't run off. And uh, I was going back there probably twice a day for four or five months. Have there been any negative side effects that have come along with you habituating them? Have they been coming up too close to the house and causing any problems or anything like that? No. You know, the biggest problem I thought of was that they were getting too used to seeing uh, humans and it might endanger them. We raise goats and sheep and stuff and we've probably lost 12 or so. We, we've only lost one this year and that's the first one we've lost in like five or six years since uh, we put up woven wire around the whole place and we got some bells for the goats and uh, we keep them in locked up at night with uh, light close by. So uh, the one baby that we lost this year was the first one in about five years. So we try to take precautions as far as that. With all the predators you've got roaming around that area, dogmen included, those are probably pretty wise precautions to take. 
All right, Travis, please tell us about this encounter you had. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay, like I said, a couple of months ago, I had surgeries on both hands, two on the elbows and three on the hands. And uh, for a week, I had to eat like a dog, no pun intended. I did a lot of walking since I can't really do much else. I've been walking to the back and back and walking about a mile and a quarter or so every day, every single day. So I thought, well, me and my buddy has been going up to the mountains for a couple of years now doing this research and stuff, and uh, he's never been to the caves. So I felt like with all this walking I've been doing, I'm kind of getting my body in shape. So I invited him to go to the caves, and uh, we didn't really go to look for tracks or anything. I thought we might see something because we usually always see something, you know, either ambush structures or footprints or, you know, something out of the ordinary. So we decided to go to the caves. And uh, I didn't bring any research equipment, any casting material, anything, even though I've got some of that cached in the woods in a couple spots, so I don't have to carry it around. That stuff is very heavy, so, you know, it's hard to carry around an extra 10 pounds in your backpack when you're uh, moving around in this terrain because it's really, really gruesome. So we take off before daylight. We see some big hog tracks, like four inches long, big, nice hog tracks, coyote tracks, bear tracks. We find some Bigfoot tracks, go to the caves. Since we got guns with us and I got a friend with me, I usually don't do any of the calls and stuff or tree knocking, but I felt a little brave, so I did one big, long Bigfoot howl. Within 30 seconds, I got a tree knock from the valley. So then I'm ready to go. I'm like, okay, that's it. Let's go. So we head down from the caves and get back down to the trail, and whenever we hit the trail, the whole valley deeper than we've been, you know, not the direction we came from, but the other direction, just lit up. There was coyotes, there was Bigfoots, and then there was other howls that I couldn't recognize. I heard a dog bark before I did my howl, which is pretty unusual up there. I know there's a few wild dogs up there. After the howls, I, I tried to record it on my camera, but my camera is really not good at audio. I didn't really get much. So we started heading back. We hear some yips here and there, which could be coyotes, and then uh, something was trailing behind us. Well, I, I didn't I didn't mention the handprint. Before we got to the caves, there was a handprint in the sand, and the fingers in that were about eight inches long. Yeah. And after we crossed the creek where the handprint was, we, we hear something trailing behind us. Then we get up about another mile, and we find a dogman track. And it has three big-looking toes in the front, and it comes down like a hill in the back. The whole thing was probably nine inches long. And it wasn't there whenever we went to the caves. So this thing that's trailing us took the canyon and went around through the canyon and cut back in front of us and left that track. And it ended up following us for like three miles. We could hear it run ahead of us, and then we would catch up to it and pass it. And then it would go back ahead of us again. And we could hear it. It wasn't trying to be quiet. You know, and just to make sure I wasn't crazy, I would ask my friend, where do you hear it now? And he would point in the direction. I'd be like, yep, that's where I hear it. And we'd just keep walking. I, I didn't bring my dog because it was such a long hike to the caves, and she has seizures sometimes, so I really don't want to get her too deep in the woods these days. So we keep walking, and then we come across some tracks in the left side of the mud, and uh, there's like five or six more of the same kind of tracks. And these are deep in the mud and just really, really nice-looking tracks. They weren't there when we first went either. So we keep walking. We get up to the ridge where it goes up high on the right, and the creek's way down the hill to the left. The trail goes away from the creek. And uh, my friend sees something running down the trail. He says, I just saw something running down the trail there. He didn't tell me what he saw. So we get down the hill, finally, where the trail goes back down close to the creek. And we're walking. And I see something red on the creek, down on Rock Creek. So I'm like, hey, look at that. Do you see that red thing? That's awful red. That's not natural. Because it was like blood red, and it wasn't like a, you know, it, it, it was out of place. So I want to check it out. I'm like, I'm going to go down and check it out. My friend's like, uh, dude, are you sure you want to do that? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go check it out. And, uh, you know, he didn't tell me what he saw. I, I walked down to the creek, and um, it's a poncho draped over a tree. So I pick up the poncho and start bringing it with me, and uh, I'm walking back up, and he, he's already like halfway to the creek, a little farther down, watching my back, of course, 
and uh, I hear, <laughs> the first thing I said was, dude, get my back, get my back. I was waiting for the gunfire because this thing sounded like it was 30 yards away from me. And uh, it threw its voice towards me. You know, it was growling at me. It growled at me. It growled at me. And I was waiting for the gunshot or waiting for this thing to grab me. And uh, it didn't happen. We got back to the trail, and he still didn't tell me what he saw until we got back home. Just so the listeners know, I, I wasn't drinking or anything, but as soon as I walked in the door, I was ready for a shot of rum. And I, and I, I hardly drink at all these days, but uh, that's one time in my life that I can say I probably needed a drink. Yeah, I'd say so. If you weren't a drinker at that point, it'd probably be a good time to start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But right. I want to interject something here, Travis. That print that you saw that looked like it had as you described it to me in the pre-interview, doggish looking toes with a heel, more of a human looking heel pressed into the back of the print. Canine type dog men will sometimes kind of squat down on their hocks a little bit and it'll leave an artifact in the print that looks kind of like a heel. I wonder if that's not what you saw there. You said the print was only about nine inches long. If that was the case, then maybe it just squatted down partially in that mud, and that's why it didn't extend all the way back to show the full length of that hawk. What do you think about that idea? Well, that sounds about right compared to the one that I casted this morning when we went back, because it was more deep, and it was longer, and uh, more detailed. It did seem like that, and, and there was very detailed claws in the toes. I, I wish I could catch that one. It's almost at the caves and it's a long ways and we've even had some rain so I don't even know if it's still there. But uh, it, it did look a little different than the other ones and that's probably a good call. Yeah, because canine type dog men, they don't have prints that look like a type 3's print at all. So that's the only thing that I could think of. That's the only thing that comes to mind that could possibly explain what you were seeing that day. One thing that does bother me is the fact that Jeff apparently did see more than he initially let on. You told me after the fact that he got a pretty good view of that dog man that was down below you. How did he describe the appearance of that dog man? Well, there's a trail down there that Jeff didn't know about. You know, I just told him that there's a trail down there. Uh, it's not as good a walking trail as the others, but hunters use it to go along the creek. But he said it was seven and seven and a half feet. And much heavier than, than him or me. It was about 60 yards away, traveling the same direction that we were to get ahead of us. And he said it was dark brown or black, and the fur was covering the whole body, and it moved hunched over, and the head was like wolf-shaped. He said the arms was, uh, I'm reading here, the arms, arms were longer than ours, but uh, also longer in what a human would be that size. And the hands looked huge. Uh, he didn't know if, if they ended in claws. He couldn't see it that close, and he couldn't see the eye color or anything. But he said the knees were bent backwards like the hind legs of a dog, and he called it a skinwalker. Yeah, from those physical features that he commented on, sounds like he did a pretty typical description of a canine-type dog man to me. That's what I would expect for him to report if he really did see one. Were you upset with him because he didn't tell you that he had seen that dog man clearly before he allowed you to go down to look at that poncho? Yeah, I, I was, even though his reasons, you know, I mean, he didn't want to freak me out too bad up there. But, you know, I kind of probably needed to be a little freaked out because I obviously wasn't freaked out enough when I walked down to the creek. You know, if, if he would have told me what he saw and that it was, you know, doing a trot, like he said, that wasn't even a jog, and it was probably going 20 to 25 miles an hour, and it looked like the werewolf from Skyrim is how he described it. I probably wouldn't have went down to the creek to check on the poncho. Yeah, I don't think many people would have. Yeah, that's information that you need to know right away. Don't hold out info like that. In the pre-interview, you voiced concerns to me about the possibility that the dogman you and Jeff encountered that day followed you home. Have you seen anything that leads you to believe it did follow you home that day? No, I was just concerned that maybe the smell, because if it could smell anything like a wolf or a dog and has that sharper sense of smell, then I'm sure it knows where I live because this isn't far from my home at all. The back of our property is probably a mile and a half 
how the crow flies from where we found some of the tracks. After having an encounter with a dog man that close to your home, I really hate to be the bearer of bad news, but unfortunately I can't see how it wouldn't have at least followed you home one of the times that you had gone back there and ventured back home. I've got no doubts whatsoever it knows where you live, unfortunately. I also unfortunately wouldn't be surprised if it did pay you a visit sometime. Hopefully it's not going to be a bad one, but as curious as they are and mischievous at the same time, I'd be really surprised if it didn't do that. Even though we drive to the entrance to the woods where we go hike from, and it's about seven-tenths of a mile from my house or so, it it is still, you know, it's still disconcerting knowing how well their sense of smell is. And, you know, I wouldn't doubt if he showed up, but if he does, uh, I've got silver bullets ready. Well, I'd highly recommend you don't pull the trigger on that dog man unless you think or even know that you're going to die, because if you do pull that trigger in a situation where you didn't have to, you really increase the chances that you just might die. Right. Well, I know for sure, without a doubt, that I'm going to die. Well, hopefully someday way down the road in the future rather than sooner. Right. At least I hope. (laughs) (laughs) You told me that you don't think fans of your YouTube channel will like you talking about your dogman experiences. Why do you think that? You know, whenever I first saw the Bigfoot track, the first thing I said was, uh, Bigfoot's real. And the second thing I said was, why did it have to be me? You know, because a lot of people think I'm a conspiracy theorist anyway about stuff. My friends at first were like, oh, Travis has gone crazy. And until they started seeing that I was collecting footprint tracks and I'm posting all this stuff, and then they're like, well, maybe he's on to something. You know, that's pretty interesting. That's an interesting track. And then now with the dog man thing, it's like it, people have a, a easier time believing in Sasquatch because there's more information out there. Even though werewolves and dog men and Anubis and all this stuff has been around for, you know, hundreds or thousands of years. And uh, people just have a, a harder time dealing with it, including myself. You know, I'm, I'm kind of having a hard time with it. Yeah, even if you see one at five feet, it's still hard to wrap your head around. The idea that something like that could exist, it's just beyond comprehension. Please tell us about the time you, your dog, and Jeff were chased out of the woods by those things that surrounded you that day. Well, we were up on the ridge. I didn't have any falsetto because I was developing a cold, so I couldn't do any kind of whoops or anything. I usually don't do that kind of stuff anyway, but... I decided to do a couple tree knocks, and I was doing some low monkey noises, like ooh, 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 like that, just real low kind of ape-type noises. We kept walking down the ridge, and then something came to the top of the ridge to the right of us and started trailing us. And then we got down to the bottom of the ridge. There's a little break spot there. We took a break, and Jeff started playing some crying babies on his cell phone. And it wasn't really that loud. It was It's a cell phone. It can't really get that loud. And then whatever was trailing us up the hill came closer, and then there was something down by the creek that come up, and then there was something in the other direction that we weren't going out. So me and my dog and Jeff sitting there looking at each other, and neither one of us said anything. My dog looked at me, I looked at my dog, we all, you know, we all looked at each other in the eyes, and we knew that we were surrounded. We didn't have to say anything. I think one of us said, you ready? And we're like, yeah, and we just go, and we start walking out. And as we're walking out of the woods, we're being trailed from 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 6 o'clock. You know, I'm kind of backing out of the woods, watching my back, because something's at at our 6 o'clock, and I don't want it to sneak up on us. That's when I see movement from one big tree to another. And it just moved from one tree to another real quick. And it looked about 8 foot tall, solid black. It didn't look fat like I would expect a Sasquatch to look. It looked more skinny and tall, you know, kind of lanky and tall. Did you ever get a chance to see its head, whatever it was? No, I didn't get a good look at it. I just saw something black, about eight foot tall, jump from one side to another. No one can fault you for not being able to take a good look at its head. You weren't expecting to see it up there in the first place. might have been a dog, man. They do spend a lot of time in trees, at least it would seem. But everything that's up in the tree like that, that moves and is large, isn't a dogman, of course, so who knows what it was. 
Please tell us about the Oklahoma sightings you've been researching, including the Howler reports. Well, I've noticed that there's other cryptids around. There's actually hyena reports in the Arkansas area that could be a dogman on all fours, or it could be Bigfoots on all fours. There's reports of dogmen in Hevener, Oklahoma, which is right across the mountain. There's big cat reports, too, as far as other cryptids. And I've found six-inch-long fur balls myself that are solid black that looks exactly like the fur balls that they find on the jaguars in South America. From what I understand, the day after you had that initial encounter with that dog man, you and Jeff, you went back the next day to look for prints. You had something interesting happen. Please tell us about that. Well, um, I don't know why, and I don't know how we ended up going back, because after being growled at, I was pretty much terrified. Both of us are pretty crazy guys, but there was just something that drew us back up there. We wanted to go cast the footprints. All I had was a can of Big Gap filler. I, I use that stuff to cast tracks quite a bit because it dries quick. 30 minutes or an hour, you can take your track and go, and you don't have to go back the next day, which is what we were trying to avoid is, is going back there as much as possible. So we went up there, and we almost walked all the way to the caves looking for these tracks. Somehow we missed them on the way. I started casting a couple of Bigfoot tracks because we, we stepped over a dozen Bigfoot tracks. As a matter of fact, I saw a mountain lion track this morning, and I laughed at it and just stepped right over it because that's kind of the least of my concern these days. I was casting these two Bigfoot tracks, and it was a smell that was awful. It was just real, real fishy, awful smell. We waited for the cask to dry, and we picked up the tracks and started heading back, and we were trailed again about three miles again. We could hear the bipedal steps clunk, 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 in the grass to the left of us, or in, you know, in the woods to the left of us. And uh, it was just, you could tell it was bipedal track. I don't know if you've heard a turkey running in the woods, but it sounded bipedal. Turkeys make that sound. Turkeys are bipedal. It sounded like a jog to the left of us, and uh, it definitely followed us again. We went back this morning to get the tracks because we finally found them on the way out. So we went back to cast the dogman track, or one of them at least. It took a gallon of water and one whole box of plaster repairs to get one dogman track. While I'm casting the track this morning, my friend's telling me, hey, hurry up, hurry up. And I could see him and my dog looking behind us, and he told me that he heard bipedal steps again, but this time it was more like a sneaking kind of bipedal. My dog looked concerned, too. She heard it, and she was looking in that direction. That's one reason I like to have her with me for the extra ears and nose. Since we wasn't going all the way to the caves, I took Mika's dog with me this morning. I finished the track, and instead of measuring the distance between footprints and getting good pictures of all the other tracks like I wanted to, we just went ahead and left. And uh, we're going to go back and get that track in the morning, and I'm going to try to measure distance between tracks and get some pictures of the other tracks and stuff while I'm up there. Hopefully we won't have anything sneaking up on us tomorrow. I hope not, too. That's got to be awfully unnerving hearing something trying to sneak up on you like that. Yeah, there's videos on the Internet of how to cast Bigfoot tracks. People step in the mud and cast their own footprint, but it's a lot different casting an 18-inch track when you're in the middle of the woods and you smell some funk and you got something sneaking up on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine that really drives the stakes up quite a bit. Now the dogmen are in your area, has that seemingly affected the Sasquatch there too? I think the Sasquatch are deeper in the woods now, but that could be because of the water. We're kind of in a drought right now and the water's deeper in, so I don't think it really affects them that much. It's funny how Sasquatch seem to act differently in various areas of the country whenever dogmen are around. In some areas, in my opinion, in most areas, whenever dogmen move into the area, Sasquatch seem to head for the high country, but there are areas where people report that the Sasquatch don't seem to move off all that much. It's almost like they're not all that bothered by the fact that the dogmen are there. That's just another thing that's really hard to understand and, and figure out. Now that you know dogmen are out there, Travis, how has that changed your outlook on Bigfoot? Well. I used to uh, be hiking through the woods doing my research, and I'd hear something off in the woods, and I'd be like, oh, I hope that's not a Sam squinch. But now these days, I hear something uh, trailing me in the woods, and I'd be like, God, I hope that's a Sasquatch. 
Yeah, it's funny how your outlook changes whenever dogmen come into the picture. In the pre-interview, you told me that the show played a role in you being so precautious around the dogmen in your area. Is there anything in particular you've heard on the show here that's made you so careful around them? Uh, the fact that they don't seem to be docile at all, and they seem to be vicious. A lot of Bigfoot reports, they're not really vicious unless they're provoked. The fact that their legs are backwards it freaks me out, and the fact that they've been to children's windows, tapping on the windows, and the fact that people feel a sense of evil when they're around, uh, all that stuff freaks me out. Yeah, that's pretty typical. They are the embodiment of creepy. From what I understand, you've been having some nightmares lately. Tell us about that. Well, since I was growled at, and uh, we've had the encounters, uh, my sleep has been really restless, and, and usually I'm, I'm running from them, or trying to fight them, or trying to find a way to kill them or something, or get away from them in my dream. And I'm hoping this doesn't keep occurring. I'm hoping my sleep returns back to normal. Well, I hope it does, too. Please tell us about your poncho experience you had this morning. Well, we walked down to cast one of the dogman tracks, and we didn't see the poncho there. Whenever we left, I hung the poncho right by the trail over a stump or a limb sticking out over the trail. Whenever we went this morning, I didn't see it. We, whenever we were coming back, I mentioned to Jeff, did you uh, notice that anything about the poncho? And he's like, yep, it was gone. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Neither one of us saw it. And then whenever we were coming back, we rounded the curve, and there's the poncho right there on the trail, hanging on a limb, right in the middle of the trail while we, where we walked past earlier in the morning. That sounds more like a Sasquatch type of a trick to me than a dogman type of thing. I'm not sure if dogmen will even pull tricks like that on you in the first place. They might, but... I can't say that I've ever heard of anyone seeing them doing something like that, so it really makes you wonder. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, hopefully it was Sasquatch that were doing that. All right, Travis, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, the only comment that I would have is to tell the listeners to make sure that they watch their back when they're in the woods. Take a gun, take a friend, take a dog. And just know that there's other things out in the woods that we're not being told about. There's other type of cryptids, you know, Sasquatch, Dogmen, Big Cats, and who knows what else. Yeah, if Sasquatch and Dogmen are out there, it does make you wonder what else is too. Well, thanks again, Travis, so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Vic. Well, have yourself a great night. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Bye. Our second guest tonight wishes to remain anonymous. For that reason, I'm going to refer to him as Eric during the show. Eric, welcome to Dogman Encounters Radio. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Eric, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm uh, 26 years old. I am really active with my Boy Scout troop. Every time that there is a camp out, I'll try to go with them. And I have always been active with the Boy Scouts. I've been attending meetings and been camping out since I was in the age of 12. I decided being uh, at the forest for a very long time. And every time I get to go by myself, just to enjoy the outdoors, I do. In fact, one time during my second year in camping, I managed to encounter a bear by myself. You know, young, I tried to ignore the rules of being with a buddy, so I ventured up into the Kemaic campsite. That's where I found the bear eating some trash that some people left behind. I guess that was my first real encounter with the nature and the creatures they inhabited. Also, I enjoy shooting for sport, and I do own several guns, and I'm quite proficient with them. Right now, I just am studying at the university. Running into a beer like that on one of your first outings into the woods, that's one heck of an intro, to say the least. Yeah, it was intimidating, but thankfully, it was a juvenile. It wasn't fully grown. Still, for a 
13 year old who was probably 5 feet 5, encountering a creature that was probably as tall as myself and as menacing. But from my perspective, anyway, there's a difference between seeing a bear at the zoo with the protection of uh, the rails or glass and finding it right there in front of you, no more than 20 yards away, with nothing in between but a trash can. Yeah, there is a big difference when there aren't any bars between you two. Before the incident you're here to talk about happened, Derek, how much time had you spent in the woods? It sounds like you had spent quite a bit of time out there. Yeah, I enjoy camping. There are several uh, camp. Fortunately, where I live, it's desert, but I enjoy doing the travel time to go to New Mexico, which is my closest to forest area. I enjoy going to that area a lot, Lake Roberts, outside of Cloudcroft. And of course, when I joined the Boy Scouts and we do some of our outings, even in the desert, at the mountains, it's always good fun. I enjoy. I just enjoy the peace and quiet that I get when I'm there. The wind, the cool, you know, because I am here at the desert, so it's something, it's always a treat for me to be there. I try to get as much out as much as I can. You know, it's easy to think of New Mexico if you haven't been there as a barren place that wouldn't have all that much to offer as far as scenery, but that couldn't be further from the truth. It's really got a lot to offer. Oh, yeah, definitely, especially here. When I make my trip, there's this space when you see a time when you see nothing more but desert and the desert plants of Congo Bernadoas here. And then once you go through a tunnel, and you go out on the other end, it transforms. You start seeing pine trees, the temperature goes down. It's an incredible transformation. It took me by surprise the first time I went there. Oh, I'll bet it did. That's one of the great things about being out west. You can see things and do things that when you're out east, it's just so hard to find, if not impossible to find. Without telling us what happened, Derek, please tell us why you were at the location where your incident happened. We always plan a Boy Scout trip, a week-long camp for the boys to get their merit badges, have fun, you know, give them time to be away from home and experience the outdoors. Sometimes we choose different camps, or we sometimes go to the same place for a couple of years or more. This time we decided to go there because they had the merit badge that the boys needed to complete, and we thought it was going to be a great idea for them to be there, enjoy the forest and everything else. So we planned the trip, and we met Sunday about, I'd say, 1. And we made sure that the boys had everything packed, that they didn't forget anything, and make sure they were under Class A. That's a Boy Scout uniform before we arrived at the camp. The drive took us around three and a half hours. And as I said before, it's great to see the desert and then going into the forest. During that time, I, I actually drove three of the kids with me in the car. And during that time, I started telling them, you know, it's going to be fun, the forest is going to be okay, especially since we have a scout who barely turned 12 and just joined our troop. Thankfully, he had an older brother coming with him, so that made the transition a lot better. Your incident happened at a place called Potato Canyon, New Mexico. Please tell us about Potato Canyon. What's the layout like there? Well, it's a beautiful place. As the title indicates, it's a glue canyon in there. It's full of pine trees. There's tall grass. It's several miles away from Cloudcroft. There's a couple of farms in between the area. Then there's the Boy Scout Lodge and uh, several designated campsite with tents, you know, a place area for us to sleep. We're surrounded by forests, uh, by, by pine trees, tall grass, and uh, since it's a canyon, it's a little bit upward, the elevation. So there's a lot of hiking going around. Sounds like a really neat place to me. It is. It's beautiful. Oh, it sounds like it. All right, let's jump right into what happened to you and your troop that night. Please give us every last detail that comes to mind. We arrive at around 5.45, almost 6. Dinner already started, so everyone was already at the dining hall. Since we already had dinner, preparing for that, 
we took some of our stuff and hiked up to our campsite. The ranger, uh, he helped us bring the rest of our tents, cots, and all the other necessities. And afterwards, we helped the kids set up everything at camp so it would be ready for that night. After the kids were settled in and we had our tents and everything, the scoutmaster went down for a meeting down there, and I was in charge of the boys. I stayed up there with the rest of the kids, with the SM and the SPL, the senior patrol leader of the troop, went down to you know what was going on with the camp, see what rules or what things needed to be obeyed during our stay in there. But we were there, the kids were behaving like kids, loudly laughing, joking around, stuff that the kids do. Afterwards, around, let's say, 8.30, the scoutmaster and the senior patrol leader returned and pretty much told us what was expected. We were allowed, actually, to have campfires this year. Last year, because it was so dry, we couldn't. So there was a fire ban. Thankfully, this year it wasn't. The kids got really excited, but unfortunately, since it had rained, the last couple of days, the wood, the grass, everything was a little bit too wet still. So as much as they tried to make a campfire, everything was too wet. So we couldn't do it that night. They were a little bit disappointed. But it was already closing to 10, which was lights out for us, meaning that we needed to be in our tents inside our sleeping bags by then. So we pretty much heard the kids towards their tents and told them that if they needed anything just to call us. The scoutmaster slept at one side of the campsite, and I slept in the other with the kids in the middle, just so that we could be closer. If the kids near or something, one of us would be closer to them. And everything was normal. Nothing was out of the ordinary. It was just it's always been all of my years that I've been camping and being with the Boy Scouts. After everything was settled in, I kept my cell phone and thought it was around 1020. Everything was okay. That's when the most terrifying sound I have ever heard in my entire life woke me up. I know it might sound slightly ridiculous. I was not even sure myself how to describe this type of sound. But it was a monumental bark. It was incredibly powerful. I would go as to describe it as a shotgun bark. It was crazy. I didn't know what to do at that point. So I look at my phone again to see what time it was and saw that it was 11.45. I, I still remember that because it woke me up and my mind and everything, just every single detail just got burned into my brain. After hearing that bark and hearing it echo throughout the canyon, I wasn't even sure what could have made that sound. That's what scared me at first. Being outside, being at the forest as much as I've been, helping with the Boy Scouts as much as I have, I have never, ever heard anything like it. And even that, and that's including me at my third year at camp, hearing a terrifying scream of what I, well, now call a cougar, a mountain lion. That those terrifying screams that they do, which sound like a woman getting killed, they heard that in the middle of the forest, near a, at another camp, around that general area. I didn't know what it was, but eventually, as I grew up and I spent more time and talked with some other people there, they informed me that it was a mountain lion. So I have heard that scream like that. I heard elk before. I have heard coyotes as well. Bears, too. But it, that sound that I heard was something incredible. It kind of hurt my head a little bit, just how powerful it was. I felt it go right through me. A couple of minutes afterwards, though, I heard a second, not as powerful bark. It sounded more submissive, kind of like if they were two things there. One obviously seemed to be in control while the other wasn't. I would say kind of felt like it was at its mercy. My mind went completely blank. I didn't know what to think at that moment. I, I just simply couldn't identify it. It certainly wasn't any of the animals I was familiar with of that area, unless there was something completely different there at that time. What I did notice 
was a lack of sound that happened during that time. There's usually a couple of birds singing or making some kind of noise during the night. You can hear the wildlife, squirrels, or raccoons just roaming around, but this time everything was simply quiet. Nothing was making a sound after that. And it remained like that for a couple of minutes, maybe a little bit longer, a few minutes more, probably, until I heard the ranger's fox barking. And it took them several minutes. I do not know why it took them so long, but I would think for a dog, probably the hardest to believe to gather its courage to go and bark at whatever that thing was. Not only did the ranger's dog start barking at it, but I also heard the dogs from the horsemanship merit badge individual also barking at the sounds. So it was at that moment that I knew it wasn't a dog. We're talking, I would estimate, at least seven to eight dogs in total from both sides barking at whatever this was. I could tell that bark I heard didn't come from a normal dog. But I have to admit that the first thing that came to mind when I heard it was a giant dog. Something massive. That's all I could think. I couldn't think of any other creature in the forest that could make any sound like the giant dog. But I knew it sounded ridiculous, so I was completely confused. But after hearing those two barks at night, I was terrified out of my mind. i never been so uncomfortable and scared in the forest like that. And believe me, I stayed awake the whole night. Oh, I don't think anyone could blame you for staying awake after hearing something like that. Did you pack up the next day and head for home? No, we didn't. Ooh, took a lot of guts to stick it out after hearing something like that. There are different kinds of barks. You've got big dogs that sound more like they're woofing than barking, and then you've got other dogs that have a sharp, true barking sound like a German Shepherd. Was this sound that you heard, was it more like a woof or more like a super loud, sharp bark? How would you describe it? I would describe it as a loud, tremendous, sharp bark. A loud, sharp bark. These things apparently make a lot of noises, but I've got to admit I've never heard any recordings where it sounded like they were barking. From what you told me, you never did see what was making those sounds, so we never will know what it was. All we can do is guess. But I can't think of anything else in the woods that could make a sound like that. I can't even go as far as to say that I know dogmen would bark like that. It's just so far out of what I have ever heard about these things, I'm not really sure what to think. Having said that, how close would you say you were to what was making those sounds? Unfortunately, I'm not really good at telling distances. When it happens like that, especially when it came to a sound so powerful like that. But if I have to guess, now that I have some time to think about it, I would think a little bit less than a quarter of a mile away from where we were. And I was grateful that there were at least two other campsites between us of the general direction of where it came. Ooh, can you imagine what the people in those campsites were thinking and going through when all this was going on? I didn't ask afterwards, yeah, unfortunately. I just didn't. It's one of those instances in which you hear something so alien, so strange. I, I, and since I didn't see anything, I didn't really ask anyone around if they have heard anything. Because I wasn't sure myself what to think at that moment. And I wasn't aware of any creature that could make any sound like that. Yeah, I think you handled it the right way. Did anyone get out of their tent while these noises were going on? Definitely not. No one that I could hear. No one got out of there to investigate anything. <laughs> I, know, I know I wouldn't go out after hearing that. No, I don't blame you at all. When you first woke up and heard those horrifying sounds, did you have any thoughts on what might have been making them? The only thing that came to mind when I heard that was giant dog. After all, it was a bark. It was loud. It was short. It was only one. 
but it was powerful, and it was a bar. Thereby, I, as funny as it might sound, that's the first thing that popped to my mind. Giant dog. Or at the very least, something with incredible lung capacity. Looking back on it now, are you glad that you never did get a chance to see what it was that was making those sounds, or is your curiosity eating away at you to the point where you do wish you would have been able to see it? Well, at that time, I was curious, but fear kept me inside my tent and wouldn't let me go out. But now, I really wish I knew what made that sound, just to make sure what it was. Because it was definitely something I have never, ever heard in my life. And I really want to know what it was. It was big. That I can tell 100%. It was a giant, it was big. It had massive lung capacity. It had to be a really big animal to make that kind of sound. But I really wish I could have gone out and find out what it was. I know right now you're curious about what it was, but I'm not so sure if the situation had presented itself where you had a chance to see this thing. I can't see that turning out all that well for you, but that's just my opinion. How long did you say you heard those strange noises? I'm kind of fuzzy on that. I'd say the first one lasted about 10 seconds with echo, and the following one happened a couple of minutes right after, also taking a couple of seconds as well. It was something really quick. If I have to throw a theory out there, it would be that. Whatever it was, there were at least two of them. And that one of them might have done something that the other one didn't agree with and let him know that he wasn't happy with that. Kind of like a small argument. Kind of like when you see a pair of dogs, one is bothering the other, and the bigger one barks at the smaller one. You know, tell them to stay away or be quiet, and the other one responded that same way. That's how long it took. I'd say from first, from a couple to at least three to four minutes most. It surprised me because it was powerful enough to wake me up and the other kids around me. Yeah, that's a night you're never going to forget, unfortunately. When all this was going on, could you hear people around you starting to stir, or was everyone around you silent? It sounds like they were silent. I could hear a little bit of shifting to my left, where the tent of the near kids were at. They didn't speak. I didn't hear them speak. I didn't hear them say anything myself, but I did hear them shift in their sleeping bags continuously. So I would think the sound, the bark, woke them up as well at the same time as it did me. Well, that was pretty much all I could see out here. All the kids moving, but from the other campsites, the nearest one, I couldn't hear anyone moving or going out to investigate. Everyone stayed inside their tents. Oh, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they didn't make a sound, just praying that whatever was making that sound would go away and not pay any attention to them. You said that when this was going on in your camp with your troop, that no one went out of their tents, but you also did say you didn't pack up the next morning and leave. Through all this, did anyone go into the woods to try and investigate what had made those sounds? No. The kids were scared, and they didn't want to hide and see what was happening. I knew that whatever it was was not going to be there, so I just spent the rest of the day just helping other kids, seeing where they were, classes they were taking. But what some of the kids did tell me that they asked some of the staff members around if they had heard it, but they simply denied it. They said it was one of the ranger's dogs. Or the horsemanship teacher's dogs, we knew it wasn't a dog, because also we heard them bark as well. It's unfortunate that the adults tried to claim it was just a regular dog that the kids had heard. The kids knew that wasn't the case, and in my opinion, that's just not the right way to handle that, but I guess you'll have that. Even though that happened, you said you stayed there for the rest of the week. Did any other strange occurrences happen while you were there for the rest of that time? No. Everything the rest of the week remained extremely quiet. Everything was nice. Nothing else happened. It was just that one night. But we were still scared. 
we were going to have a scary story time at night right next to the fire, but we decided against it after what happened. And it left us, everyone shook up. All the kids pretty much prayed <laughs> that entire week to keep whatever it was as well as the wild animals at bay. As for myself, I didn't know what it was and no one was really interested in finding out what it was. We simply stayed. The gypsy carried on. But I did have to use some sleep wheel just to fall asleep the rest of the week. I think most people would have a hard time falling asleep after experiencing something like that. Now, a lot of the people who are listening to this are going to wonder why you didn't pack up and go home right then and there. Did you ever second-guess your decision to stay? Since I didn't really know who to blame or what to blame, so that kind of sound, it was terrifying and it was scary, but it didn't really raise any uh, alarms, per se, that would indicate us for leaving. And since the rest of the week was enjoyable... I didn't really think much about it, especially since we knew that the ranger was around. That's the reason why we didn't leave. Well, I'm glad that somehow, some way, you were all able to enjoy the rest of the time you spent there. Well, not thinking about it helps a lot. <laughs> yeah, that does help, but when you bed down and it's late at night and the forest comes alive, the fact that somehow you're still able to sleep and have a good time, that's kind of amazing right there. Was there pressure from other adults to pack up and go home after you heard those noises? No, there was no pressure at all. No one talked about it. No one said anything. No one, no one commented about it. I thought it was a little bit odd. But I guess they would simply attribute it to something mysterious in the forest or the likes of it. They didn't really pay much attention to it. I've got to tell you, you and your guys don't scare easily. Now that you had that experience, do you see your troop going on future camping trips? Well, yes. We still do. We still think of planning camping trips. And maybe even going back there. Most people, as you know, probably wouldn't be able to muster the courage to go back out there again. So, you've all got brass. <laughs> Well, it was probably just ignorance of what it was. Had we known for sure what it was, we identify it. Well, maybe that would have ended up differently. If whatever had made those sounds had come into your camp, for example, I don't think that your outlook on going on future camping trips would be the same. I think you'd swear it off, and I can't say I'd blame you if you did. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> when you do go on future camping trips, are you going to change the way you do anything while you're out there? Well, personally, I'm simply going to pay more attention to my surroundings. Well, a little bit extra more attention on my surroundings, just to see what I can identify or see going around. Just to keep an eye. After all, we're there to take care of the kids. And if there's something we could do to protect them, I definitely would try to do everything I can in my power for that to happen. Yeah, staying really alert to your surroundings is never a bad idea when you're out there in the woods like that. All right, Eric, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, I just wish I knew what it was. I was fascinated by it, by the sound, by how it scared me, by the way how it scared everything in the forest. It's something right out of the horror movie or a novel, or stories that other people tell you about. And that's what prompted me to try to look, research, and find what it was. And that's when I came uh, to your show. Read, uh, heard some uh, accounts, read a little bit about the dog man, and uh, it made sense to me. I did it, but to be honest, I'm not sure what it be. It's just that that seems like the most logical answer. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting a, a creature so big and terrifying to actually be stopped in the forest. Well, like a lot of people, I think you're happy to know that something like that is out there so that you can do certain things to hopefully prepare yourself and limit the chances of something bad happening to you compared to not having a clue that something like dogmen are out there and just wandering around without 
preparing yourself for a possible confrontation. It's not comforting knowing that they're out there, but for me, I'd rather know that they're out there and take steps to hopefully cut down the chances of having a problem than not know they're out there and put myself in some bad situations where I just might pay some kind of an unfortunate price. Like we talked about before, we don't know if it was a dog man. I guess it could have been a Sasquatch that was making those sounds. I'm not all that familiar with Sasquatches making barking sounds. I guess there have been times where they've supposedly made sounds like that, but that's the big mystery. I wouldn't know either. All I know is that it was something big and that it had massive lungs. That's all I can 100% be positive about. It had to be something big and it had to be incredible lung capacity. I really wish I knew what it was. But for me personally to learn that there's something out there, to learn what I heard might be one of that curiosity is what brought me to your show to report my encounter and see if I could get a little bit closer at finding out what it was. Well, I'm not happy that you had that incident happen to you, but I am glad you found out about this show and consequently the fact that dog men are out there. I guess that's about the only good news you can take from that experience. Well, Eric, I want to thank you for sharing your story and that info with us. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. I just hope that this helps someone else, you know, be more alert when they go into the woods and pay a little bit more attention to every little detail just to see it, to make sure that they're safe. Oh, I'm sure it will help. Thanks again for sharing that. Thanks again for coming on the show. You have yourself a great night, okay? Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter and you'd like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, you can reach me at contact at dogmanencounters.com. I'd love to hear from you.